of the background noise first. Yes. Kundi, please stop the background noise. Yes, yes sir. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, today is our twentieth. I think that only 18 participants have joined. Do you expect some more? They come, sir. As huh? thank God people, as thank God people will log in. Huh. So we start on time. Should we wait for five minutes or we will start? We start sir, normally we start, sir. Yeah? We start. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so... Uh, Welcome everybody. Uh, today is our 20th series of uh, virtual lecture series in general surgery. Uh, we have two eminent speakers, Dr. Mohan Joshi and Dr. Hemant Kulkarni, who will be celebrating on small bowel pathologies. Uh, I would request our president, Dr. Nilayan Agarwal, to address the gathering. Dr. Nilayan Agarwal. Thank you, Rajesh. A warm good evening on this Friday for the 20th lecture series of the Mumbai Surgical Society. A uh, warm welcome to Dr. Mohan Joshi and Raymond Kulkarni to CA faculty from Mumbai who will be sharing their experience on topic which would interest all of us and Dr. Rajpal and Dr. Ganesh for sharing this session. A huge thank you to all of you. And uh, before wasting too much of time, we... Uh, are uh, committed to the timing and hence we will start on time. So I would not waste too much of time coming between the speakers and the, uh, uh, the delegates. So Rajesh, please take the topics ahead. Okay. Thank, thank you, Niranjan. Uh, today we have two eminent chairperson from their individual field. Dr. Ganesh Bhagwat uh, is a consultant general surgeon and laparoscopic surgeon at Apollo Spectra Hospital. He was assistant professor of surgery for five years in MUHS. He is an excellent laparoscopic surgeon, Dr. Ganesh Bhagwat. Our second chairperson is Dr. Dilip Rajpal. He is specialized in single incision lap cells and laser varicose. He is an honorary assistant professor at JJ Group of Hospital. He is a consultant surgeon at Apollo Spectra and the Memorial Hospital. So I'll request Dr. Ganesh Bhagwat and Dr. Dilip Rajpal to introduce our eminent speakers for today and start the session. Thank you. Over to Dr. Ganesh and Dr. Dilip. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Niranjan Agarwal and Dr. Rajesh Yadav. Dr. Ganesh Bhagwat here. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, good evening. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, we can it, hear. Yes, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to chair this session uh, we have got one of our eminent teachers dr mohan joshi and dr heman kulkarni who himself has been a surgical unit head at km hospital so dr heman kulkarni i think will be uh, starting with this session as of now uh, um, and uh, i request dr heman kulkarni to please start his uh, lecture series Dr. Himan Kulkarni? Yeah, I, am, uh, I think Dr. Mohan Joshi is there. Uh, so he yes, wanted yes. to start it before. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. There is a rechange in plan. Dr. Mohan Joshi will be speaking first. Yeah. Okay, that's a rechange in plan. So let yeah, us yeah. Uh, request uh, Dr. Mohan Joshi to please start his lecture series. As I said, Dr. Mohan Joshi requires no introduction. He has be, he's a wonderful teacher and has been... Um, uh, uh, guiding light and beacon in our all our uh, endeavors in MSS as well as uh, in uh, the surgery department, both at Sion Hospital and at uh, Nair Hospital. Dr. Mohan Joshi, sir, please, we request you to please start your uh, lecture series. Yes, yes. Thank you so much and good evening, Dr. Ganesh Bhagwat and Dr. Yes. Dilip. Uh, I hope I am audible. Yes, you are very much audible, sir. Yes. Please. Yes. <clears throat> uh, way back, uh, we used to diagnose acute intestinal obstruction by clinical history, stethoscope, and by plain X-ray abdomen. And if that showed multiple air fluid levels, and if the patient had constipation, obstipation, and distension of abdomen with copious bilious vomiting, we would subject the patient without any hesitation to laparotomy. 
that was the scenario way back we have added several several number of more investigations now and still but uh, we need to go into the depth for uh, people who are uh, doing their ms dnb students they should uh, go ahead with uh, you know learning the whole thing properly so therefore this endeavor is this is this okay i am not uh, very well versed with sharing the screen but is that okay that everybody please, can see sir, yes. sir, sir please yes. please make it full screen sir please make okay, it full screen okay okay i'll make it full screen yes very good ha huh. yes sir see, the definition of bowel obstruction is defined by lack of about transit of intestinal contents regardless of etiology that means that this could be a functional obstruction where there is no peristalsis but it is obstruction that the food is not propelled out or aired is called as obstruction bowel obstruction may involve only small bowel only large bowel or sometimes both and the systemic alteration in the metabolism the electrolyte imbalance and the neurosecretory or neuroregulatory mechanisms which are responsible for the pathophysiology of this particular intestinal obstruction the most common site of intestinal obstruction is small bowel the most common cause of intestinal obstruction is overall adhesions in adults also adhesions in children intersusception in infants intersusception and in neonatal age group you have got what is called as duodenal atresia is one of the common cause according to type the intestinal obstruction is classified as dynamic mechanical where the peristalsis is working against a mechanical obstruction that means that it could be stricture it could be band which is obstructing etc and a dynamic or what we call it as paralytic obstruction when the mechanical element is absent peristalsis may be absent or non propulsive form and according to the level we classify it as high and low small or large bowel intestinal obstruction acute sudden severe colicky pain with distension and early vomiting and late constipation is a sign usually of an intestinal obstruction which is small bowel chronic lower abdominal pain with constipation followed by distension of a long duration is usually the sign or a clinical picture of a large bowel obstruction acute on chronic short history of distension with vomiting on a long history of pain and constipation is something which is called as acute or chronic intestinal obstruction and sub acute means incomplete on and off intestinal obstruction according to nature it is simple or it is complicated when we call it as incarcerated or strangulated now what are the causes of intestinal obstruction dynamic intestinal obstruction intraluminal that is fecal impaction foreign body bezoars gallstone these are reasons for dynamic intestinal obstruction intramural is stricture and malignancy malignancy quite common in large bowel not in small bowel but however not rare adhesions and bands hernia external and internal volvulus and intersusception these are some of the causes of intestinal obstruction which are dynamic a dynamic is paralytic ileus mesenteric vascular obstruction or occlusion and pseudo obstruction these are some of the causes of a dynamic obstruction distension of small intestine is caused by accumulation of gas or a swallowed air and as a result what happens there is a stagnation of fluid this stagnation of fluid leads to bacterial overgrowth this is the basic pathophysiology of intestinal obstruction bacterial overgrowth leads to diffusion of bacterial toxins across the wall or that is called as transmural diffusion of these toxins or the bacteria and fluid ingested fluid saliva biliary and pancreatic secretions 
uh, obstructed. Dehydration, which is caused by reduced intake, then what happens? That you are not able to eat, you are not able to drink, and reduced absorption, increased loss, resulting in vomiting and sequestration of fluid. Systemic effects of obstruction are water and electrolyte losses, mainly the potassium and the transmural or the transmigration of the bacteria and the toxins lead to sepsis because there is a peritonitis-like picture and this results in cardiopulmonary dysfunction and renal failure because of diminished perfusion and hypotension. And this is a sequelae that you can have shock. And eventually, if the obstruction is not treated, one can land up with death and uh, you know, the sequelae of intestinal obstruction. Obstruction with compromised blood flow. This is what we call it as strangulated intestinal obstruction. It occurs in nearly 25% of the patients of small bowel. It is usually associated with hernia, volvulus, intersusception, and long-standing acute small bowel obstruction, which is not treated. And what happens because of that? That the enormous distension of small bowel results into pressure, and that pressure exceeds the intracapillary pressure, which results into venous obstruction, and eventually it follows the arterial obstruction. Ischemia, gangrene, and perforation of small bowel are the sequelae of strangulated intestinal obstruction. And this is a very classical picture or a classical feature of an umbilical hernia, wherein the bowel is strangulated, it is becoming dusky, blackish, and red. And this is a sign of strangulated intestinal obstruction with twist in the intestine. Now, what do you mean by closed bowel loop obstruction? Closed bowel loop obstruction is a specific type of obstruction in which the two points along the course of the bowel are obstructed at a single location plus forming a closed loop. Usually, this is due to adhesions or twist of the mesentery or internal hernia. A large bowel, it is caused by volvulus or colonic growth or an incompetent ileocecal wall. This gives rise to uh, you know, a classical uh, you know, large bowel obstruction, which is a closed loop obstruction, is sigmoid volvulus. Classical closed loop obstruction is a left colonic malignancy, which is advanced and totally occluding the left colon, resulting into ileocecal wall, which is competent. And on this side, left side, you have got a growth where the structurous growth has caused obstruction. In small bowel, it is usually caused by closed loop obstruction, in fact, which I have given you. These are the clinical or the schematic diagrams, which I would like to show you how a small bowel obstruction can be because of twist and a large bowel obstruction could be because of growth, ileocecal wall, and enormous distension of small bowel eventually resulting, I mean, large bowel, eventually resulting into a large bowel and small bowel obstruction. <clears throat> How will you diagnose? The diagnosis has to be done by history, clinical examination, and investigation. History of colicky abdominal pain, copious bilious vomiting, these are the hallmarks of classical small bowel intestinal obstruction or small bowel obstruction and the clinical examination, what it could reveal. It could reveal a distension of abdomen, visible hyperperistalsis, audible hyperperistalsis, and then you need to do investigations, several investigations, which include blood investigations, showing hemoglobin level, which is high, concentration of the hemoconcentration, dehydration, then the WBC count could be high. These are investigations. The potassium could be low or, you know, the electrolyte disturbance, which can occur because of loss of bile and pancreatic juice. And then you have high BUN and high serum creatinine, etc. 
the other investigations which usually we do clinical features consist of vomiting colicky bilia colicky abdominal pain distension of abdomen and constipation now as far as this distension is concerned as far as the pain is concerned pain is very colicky in nature it comes and goes and it is a very classical sign of hyperperistalsis the small bowel is trying to come over whereas when the intestinal obstruction is strangulating the pain ordinarily disappears the colicky pain disappears and what happens is that you get a pain which is diffuse because of peritonitis more distal the obstruction the longer is the interval between the onset of symptoms and the appearance of nausea and vomiting and sometimes you get feculent vomiting in a large bowel obstruction more distal is the obstruction the distension is more and more whereas the earlier the obstruction say early jejunal obstruction the distension will not be that very much marked clinically constipation is failure to pass flatus or feces through rectum it is an important sign or important symptom of bowel obstruction it could be absolute and relative and bloating is accumulation of glass gas and fluid and giving rise to fullness and this is what is the sign of or the symptoms clinical features of small bowel obstruction other manifestations include fatigue infrequent urination because the urine output decreases patients become dehydrated and if there is a sign of intestinal obstruction which is strangulated you can have fever and eventually you can have electrolyte disturbance and metabolic encephalopathy and disorientation or something like that what do you see in general examination you see tachycardia you see hypotension oliguria signs of advanced dehydration can be seen and it needs aggressive resuscitation fever may be associated with infectious causes and strangulation inspection you will see the shape of the abdomen whether it is a distended or scaphoid abdomen whether there is a central distension of abdomen or not or it is upper abdominal distension lower abdominal distension etc you can have a look at the umbilicus see for visible peristalsis if there is a sign of previous surgery striae etc and you must look for hernial orifices this is very important investigation you must do when you are doing palpation you must warm up your hands and see for tenderness guarding rigidity guarding and rigidity are the signs of strangulated intestinal obstruction you must also again look for hernial orifices and you must also see what is called as impulse on coughing whether the impulse on coughing is present it is a irreducible hernia if it is strangulated and obstructed hernia there is a loss of impulse on coughing auscultation either will relieve if it's a dynamic obstruction gross hyperperistalsis whereas if the strangulation has set in or if there is ileus the bowel sounds will be disappearing and you will see a silent abdomen look for any rectal mass by doing per rectal examination or presence of feces in the rectum this is very important in this thing investigations or clinical examination now let's go to the investigations as i told you we need to do cbc serum electrolytes bio and creatinine and if there are signs of acidosis if the patient is grossly dehydrated if the person has got guarding and rigidity if the tachycardia is too much and bp is low you need to do blood gas analysis serum lactate concentration and amylase to rule out sometimes you have a hemorrhagic acute pancreatitis increase in the serum lactate concentration may raise a suspicion of intestinal ischemia this is very important intestinal fatty acid fatty acid binding protein is a highly sensitive marker d dimer is also another highly sensitive marker for mesenteric ischemia and strangulated intestinal obstruction <clears throat> radiological examination k 
can be done and this is important is to see for multiple air fluid levels flat and upright films can be taken and to see for free pneumoperitoneum these are the two x rays which are showing multiple air fluid levels more than 3 to 4 air fluid levels are seen especially in the upper abdomen which suggests that this could be a small bowel obstruction may be jejunal there is another uh, investigation which is another x ray which also shows that jejunal concertina pattern and distended jejunum suggesting acute intestinal obstruction <clears throat> this is another a solitary loop of jejunum which is distended is seen on my right side and on the other side you can see large bowel shadows so this x ray is very important and there was no other investigation more than this investigation there was no other investigation than this when we were resident doctors and we used to take decisions whether to explore or not to explore on this particular thing we lecture get an antar phone kar to lecture get an antar kar this is a sign this is this is a sign of what is called as sigmoid volvulus bent inner tube sign which is a very classical of sigmoid volvulus and the other side is the x ray of sickle volvulus which you can see that massively distended large bowel you can see that and this is what happens in sickle volvulus nowadays we do computed tomography computer tomography gives much more information the information is towards the vascularity of the intestine the site of obstruction the size of obstruction and very rarely the ct could be something like uh, doing something which is called as a therapeutic trial or when we give a person what is called as uh, you know uh, the gastrographin or a contrast that itself stimulate sometimes peristal peristalsis and many times the small intestinal obstruction could get relieved if it is not tightly obstructed and if there is no gross intraluminal growth so this is what is the advantage of computed tomography and computed tomography gives you an idea whether we are heading for strangulated intestinal obstruction or otherwise <clears throat> but the time is lost if the patient comes but by the time that we are able to resuscitate we can get a quick ct scan done of that patient ultrasonography is infrequently done in intestinal obstruction when you have uh, intestinal obstruction which is very obvious you may not do ultrasound it may not much it may not help much because the ultrasound waves the enemy of ultrasound wave is air video capsule endoscopy though it is a theoretical thing to say i am really scared to do video capsule endoscopy if there is obstruction and the obstruction is say for because of tuberculous uh, stricture or something and the video capsule endoscopy might get stuck it is not a sound thing to do that it is mainly to detect the sites of ulcers it is mainly to detect the nature of ulcers and to see the mucosa and to see if there is a bleeding but i would not do video capsule endoscopy or capsule endoscopy in a patient with suspected strong suspicion of intestinal obstruction because the capsule is likely to get blocked there what is the management of intestinal obstruction the treatment of the acute phase is nothing but to keep the patient nil by mouth keep the patient nil by mouth and pass a large bore rhinus tube or what we call it as naso jejunal tube or there is a tube which comes is the freca tube which has got length which is much longer so it can go in the duodenum and naso gastric aspiration should be carried out sometimes you can get after passing the rhinus tube you can get liters of fluid out or liters of bile out this way what can happen is the decompression of the small intestine and therefore the sequelae of over distension of intestine could be reverted 
could be sort of you know circumvented and the vomiting and aspiration could be avoided then comes this aggressive fluid resuscitation this fluid resuscitation has to be a crystalloid fluid with adequate amount of potassium but you need to be very careful that you are not dealing with metabolic acidosis you are not dealing with acute tubular necrosis or a very high uh, bun and creatinine in such case giving potassium may not be required or it has to be given very judiciously the resuscitation has to be guided by urine output if the patient is hemodynamically stable normal renal function if the patient has then you are not worried otherwise you must pass a central venous catheter either subclavian or jugular catheter and measure the cvp evaluate the volume status broad spectrum antibiotics must be given because though the intestinal obstruction surgery is likely to have contamination number two over distension of bowel is likely to have trans migration of bacteria so therefore it is always safer to give prophylactic antibiotics which are gram positive gram negative and may be anaerobic like clindamycin or metronidazole some cases will settle by using this conservative line of treatment and the patient may need no surgery or may need an elective surgery <clears throat> it should be considered non operative treatment for patients who are uncomplicated intestinal obstruction and by no 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 imagination you are thinking that there is a obstruction which is strangulated if there is a suspicion of a strangulated intestinal obstruction one should not go for a very long duration non operative management the plan should be at early or asap surgery and do the needful absolute contraindication to non operative management are ischemia large bowel obstruction closed loop obstruction strangulated hernia something which has perforated following intestinal obstruction or over distension of bowel and failure of contrast to reach the colon within 8 hours prompt operative intervention is mandatory that is the surgical treatment in strangulated intestinal obstruction surgery should be done asap if there is a free air in the peritoneum surgery should be done asap and closed loop obstruction ct usually demonstrates evidence of ischemia and if that demonstrates evidence of ischemia one should not wait as soon as the patient is hydrated the urine output comes and the anesthetist gives you green signal you should go ahead with surgery and you should go ahead with laparotomy and relieve the obstruction once the decision has been made to pursue the operative treatment then immediately you should take up the patient for surgery and the surgery depends on the cause of obstruction if there is a small bowel obstruction like stricture one may go ahead with resection and anastomosis otherwise creation of a stoma in a obstructed gangrenous obstruction is a sort of a choice of treatment and quick coming out is needed because you can't have unnecessary a very prolonged surgery when the patient is hemodynamically and by electrolyte means he is compromised indications of non viability of gut is absence of peristalsis loss of normal shine now when you are opening the abdomen you must see that you must uh, you know tickle the uh, intestines and if there is no peristalsis if there is a loss of shine and no pulsations in the mesentery or the whole bowel is becoming gray or black in color absent mesenteric pulsations these are some of the things which tell you that you are heading for or there is a strangulated intestinal obstruction you may wrap the piece of intestine which is uh, uh, which is brown or which is black and then see in a hot pack see for 10 minutes increase oxygen given by the anesthesiologist and reassess the viability sometimes when you are in doubt you can leave behind the leave behind the leave behind the uh, stomach leave behind the intestines back and then you may go after 24 or 48 hours for what is called as second look surgery and don't take uh, you know to ot if the patient is 
post operative carcinomatosis gross adhesions etc obstructions by adhesions and bands if they are congenital large bands associated with mal rotation you may go ahead with surgery and large procedure of adhesiolysis widening the mesentery prophylactic appendicectomy etc can be done but if it's a acquired post inflammatory adhesions idiopathic adhesions or if there is a granulomatous disease it is not possible sometimes to do total adhesiolysis because it could lead to you know serosal tears and perforation and one has to be very gentle and careful while operating this particular thing how will you prevent adhesions of the bowel to the under surface of facial incision you can interpose some omentum between the bowel and the incision in some patients complete and adequate adhesiolysis is not possible please remember that it is not there you can't have cure of the disease more grievous than the endurance of the disease in this situation conservative approach may allow acute inflammatory process to resolve within 3 to 6 months and then you may not have obstruction or you may operate at a later date most effective date till this date is application of a sheet of bioresorbable hyaluronide as membrane suturing the raw peritoneal surface is very very important intersusception if the patient is stable you can try reduction and avoid laparotomy hydro reduction or pneumatic reduction can be done but if the patient is unstable immediate laparotomy is mandatory manual reduction and then sos resection of the uh, you know volvulus has to be done this is the picture that you can see a massively distended small bowel jejunum or ileum these are vasa recti which are seen of jejunum and you can see here this is a congested bowel and almost a pregangrenous volvulus of the intestine <clears throat> a small word about sigmoid volvulus how will you do that if the patient is having ischemia if the patient is having gross distension of abdomen gaseous distension bent inner tube sign on x ray and if there are signs of ischemia please go ahead with surgery immediately but otherwise you can wait you can try to reduce the sigmoid volvulus by colonoscopy which we routinely do in cyan hospital and then at a later date operate and do elective sigmoidectomy if the patient is fit and is permitting you the anesthesiologist is permitting you gall stone ileus laparotomy and removal of the stone is must cholecystectomy should not be done in the same setting at a later date you can do that various bezoars we have removed bezoars which are starting from stomach and going to the jejunum and ileum and some bezoars have been going up to ileocecal junction i have removed that and reported that in the literature so bezoars is a known case or known cause of intestinal obstruction sometimes you have got abscess and collection so drain and treat the cause internal and external hernia and mesenteric ischemia then you have to resect and do the anastomosis if it is safe if it is not then do the stoma in malignancy resection and anastomosis or stoma is better sems may be used in acute left sided colonic tumor self expansile metallic stents and then at a later rate you can prepare the large bowel and operate the patient properly radiation enteropathy is a very very typical patient where you must know that the patient has had history of telecobalt radiation or radiation for the pelvis and many times you have very slow transit time if the patient is not in acute intestinal obstruction preferably you should not operate because there is a mesenteric ischemia because of fibrosis and any anastomosis if you do you are likely to have or present with leak so therefore one has to be very very careful and conservative as far as the radiation enteropathy is concerned unless there is a very strong stricture which is demonstrated by x ray or there is a strangulated intestinal obstruction <clears throat> early post operative small bowel obstruction one has to wait one should not immediately rush into it 
It is difficult to distinguish early obstruction from post-operative ileus. So therefore, one has to be very careful in managing the electrolyte imbalance. One has to be very careful and you should try to conservatively treat it. <coughs> if it doesn't settle and if there are signs of <coughs> perforation, if there are signs CT shows that there is something which is life-threatening, then you must go ahead with intestinal obstruction surgery. Otherwise, you should try to avoid in between the seven to 10 days or up to six to 12 weeks postoperatively represent a window when greatest inflammatory reaction is present. And these cases are extremely difficult to do and you have to be very, very gentle in managing these patients because you are likely to land up with perforation and the perforation in a patient who is having obstructed bowel the high bacterial flora and the little bacterial flora will push the patient into sepsis and will create problem. This is what happens. So one has to be very careful in deciding when to operate and when not to operate. If the patient has to be kept for a longer time on nil by mouth and IV fluids, patient need to be started on full, full parenteral nutrition and allowing the patient to settle the inflammatory reaction than going down and doing something aggressively and landing up with problem. So acute intestinal obstruction is a very, very um, common emergency with which the general surgeon faces, the GI surgeon faces, and one has to be very careful in understanding the pathophysiology and the treatment has to be a tailor-made treatment looking at the cause, the acuteness, the age of the patient and several other things, the patient, whether the patient is in gross electrolyte imbalance, dehydration and diminished renal perfusion, etc. All that needs to be carefully studied and then only the surgery has to be done properly. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, sir, for such an excellent presentation. Any questions anybody has, uh, I would like to answer, or whatever is the you know way that you would like to. So, Mr. Raj, I is asked. Uh, is there any role of serial X-rays to assess uh, progress of intestinal obstruction? Yes, yes, Doctor, uh, you know, Doctor Dilip, uh, yes, it is sir. always better to do serial X-rays. That is only possible when the patient is not in uh, strangulated intestinal obstruction, and when you are conservative and you are on rice tube feeds, IV fluids, and nil orally, etc. <laughs> And if you're not operating, you can really see the serial x-rays. And we have seen many times that the volvulus which is there or some kind of twist which is there in the abdomen, it disappears. And diminishment of the air fluid levels which are seen in the x-ray one, two, three, if they are diminishing in uh, number, and then one can always wait. And there is always a role for this particular thing, which I have not, in fact, highlighted. Yes, agreed. Dr. Joshi, you have, you have really demonstrated the importance of clinical examination, of seeing the patient thoroughly, right from palpation, percussion, auscultation, and um, basically the role of clinical uh, acumen is high in uh, small bowel obstruction. Yes, uh, some, the CT scan, sonography, other investigations are there, but a surgeon's hand and a surgeon's acumen, as you have aptly demonstrated, are, uh, what you call, the frontiers in management of small bowel obstruction, sir. You yes. have been very empathetic and you have been you have really pointed out the best ways because all these investigations take time yes 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 
whether it is in, uh, in going sending the patient for sonography ct scan or other investigations takes time when we lose time in obstruction yes. you, a wonderful presentation by dr mohan joshi thank you so much sir ganesh there are two questions in the chat box about the cocoon yes 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 sir please, please take those, please take those questions yes yes sir you uh, the please go ahead with the questions sir there in the chat box ah huh. yeah so, uh, uh, so what is sir, sir what is your uh, take on abdominal cocoon with obstruction if what do you do or how do you do abdominal cocoon i would tell you that unless there is a intra abdominal abscess unless there is a fluid collection we would not like to operate if we open the abdomen and if we find cocoon i think that one should not go on doing adhesive lysis because this can in increase the risk of perforation of bowel serosal tears future mm -hmm. intestinal obstruction which are adhesive in nature so therefore if there is a cocoon it is because of some kind of tubercular long tubercular history or it's because of uh, i would not touch the patient and unnecessary do uh, you know aggressively uh, you know create a problem for the patient one question so from my side can i ask a question chairperson yes yes, yes. yeah sir yes. many a time you see something uh, we term it as subacute kind of an obstruction where we have documented a stricture but which is not completely uh, obstructing you know and uh, patient has been diagnosed to have tuberculosis how long do you continue such patient on anticoagulant treatment before operating because many a time in our practice we have seen that you can really pull this patient on for a very long time it is not necessary that all this patient would eventually land up with surgery so which I, patient come and yeah i fully agree with you but uh, there is no uh, very clear cut uh, guideline as far as the strictures are concerned if you can manage a patient with anti tubercular drug liquid diet and i give prokinetic drugs like domstal or cisapride or something like that prokinetic drugs not uh, drugs which are going to give rise to paralysis like hyoscyamax or rotavirin or something like that then the prokinetic drugs may give some kind of relief of the obstruction and ordinarily a uh, tubercular stricture in 50% of the times at least i can tell you that the obstruction will disappear and the patient will not need treatment the second important point is that if you are forced to operate a patient after a akt for say 3 to 6 months it is better and safer because there is a very logical km hospital trial and paper by dr we bapat and all including dr supe that the tuberculomas are also there in the vessel and these tuberculomas heal the vascularity of that segment improves and then resection and doing primary anastomosis leads to logically lesser amount of leaks so this is very important because in a tuberculous abdomen or a tuberculous intestinal stricture we are dealing with something like atheromatous vessels the vessels lose their ability to contract and therefore a tubercular jejunal or ileal ulcer could bleed and give rise to substantial amount of anemia so remember that if you are even forced to operate at a later date please operate but it is safer to operate after 3 months of akt than just you know aggressively attacking on the patient the day he comes and we land up with me and we land up with several yes, yes, yes. and very true sir yes 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 sir do you put a laparoscope before opening up every patient of an intestinal obstruction nowadays or what is your approach straight away open i would not i am not a primary laparoscopic surgeon that is one thing but uh, uh, safely it could be done if you do a proper pre uh, you know proper pneumoperitoneum and when you are not suspecting something like cocoon abdomen or gross adhesions when you are not suspecting clinically you may try and reduce the sites of laparotomy that you could selectively pull up a loop 
and do resection anastomosis. Those are the advantages. I would not personally do, I would do mini laparotomy and safely open the abdomen because the concern is also the adhesions to the peritoneum or the anterior abdominal wall. So any kind of trauma by way of trocar or any kind of, uh, you know, these are very <coughs> gentle intestine. So, but it is safer and it could be done safely by creating a, a pneumoperitoneum than earlier by veres so that you are able to safely enter in if you are, you know, you are able to lift up the anterior abdominal wall from the intestines because safety is very important. These are very delicate patients who are nutritionally compromised and stand a high chance of leak. One last question. Any tips to close the uh, abdomen with the inflated bowel? There's a question in the chat box. How to close the abdomen with inflated bowel? Yes, uh -huh. yes. Uh, uh, this is a very, uh, very good question. Uh, uh, inflated bowel, and if you're going to open the bowel, you can decompress the bowel by multi-perforated suction or similar such mechanism. You can milk out the contents of the bowel towards anterior side or upper side or lower side, and then reduce the uh, so-called as, uh, you know, inflation and achieve a good closure. Otherwise, sometimes it is always better to close the skin by giving a lateral cuts and then suture it. While suturing, you have to be very careful and safe that you are not using a uh, very strong dose, uh, you know, monofilament sutures which are likely to cut your inflated bowel. You know, the suture-induced injury should not occur. So that is what you have to do that. In such case, it is always better to give incisional hernia to the patient. And at a later date, you can always... Uh, some people... Do you do cleanly anal dilatation uh, in this patient after doing a laparotomy? There is a paper by Dr. Kukle from Latur, very senior surgeon senior to us also, uh, he has published a paper about even small bowel obstruction that every patient he would do anal stretching and reduce the tone of the anal canal. And uh, uh, this has helped in reducing the leak rates, according to Pukde. This paper was read way back in 1996 in Amravati conference. Uh, of Masikon, I remember that distinctly and there was a vehement uh, charcha key. But definitely for a large bowel obstruction, we always, after anastomosis, we always do what is called as anal dilatation. But in small bowel also, it is uh, you know, advocated by some senior surgeon. Uh, and there are some proofs and literature papers uh, by our own senior consultants. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohan Joshi. That was a brilliant presentation. And with your vast knowledge and experience of seeing patients in Sain Hospital in the emergency as well as in um, managing these patients, we have really um, revisited the topic of uh, small intestinal obstruction, Cox obstruction, as well as uh, uh, obstruction due to other causes. Um, this will look, really help our PG students go a long way in um, uh, gaining more knowledge and um, uh, gravitating towards clinical um, observations and examination rather than going in for um, detailed investigations which take some more time. Thank you, Thank, so you much, so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And now invite, uh, ask Dr. Dilip Rajpal to uh, uh, introduce Dr. Heman Kulkarni and uh, start with the next part of the uh, lecture series, sir. Yeah, so I welcome uh, Dr. Heman Kulkarni, sir. Uh, sir is a ex, sir was ex uh, associate professor of KM Hospital and surgical unit head. And now he is consulting G general GI and laparoscopic surgery. Yeah, so I welcome you, sir. Yeah, so I welcome you, sir. And uh, you can please start your lecture. Yeah, thank you. 
thank you i first of all i must thank uh, dr niranjan Ag agarwal as well as dr uh, dr uh, yadav for uh, giving me this opportunity as well as uh, mumbai surgical society for uh, uh, giving this opportunity to, to speak on this so i'll be speaking on just a minute i'll just uh, check it yeah uh, now am i audible yes sir yes. okay now uh, and you can see my screen also Yes, yes, nice. Yeah, yeah. So now this presentation, the topic which has been given to me has been a really a vast topic, and I, I, I'll definitely find it difficult to cover up, you know, in a such a short duration. Fortunately, I have been given more time because uh, of this uh, another speaker who uh, was not presenting. That's why I'm going to present with uh, a small bowel infections with a surgical perspective. Now, coming to this uh, infection of the small vowel. This uh, small vowel is normally uh, the type of infection. First introduction, infections involving small intestine is a common occurrence in a day-to-day -day practice of any physician. Most of these conditions are treated at a family physician level and uh, very few require a surgeon's a gastroenterologist's opinion. The role of surgeon is limited and the surgeons are involved when there is a specific infection of small bowel, such as intestinal tuberculosis, enteric fever causing complications and ascariasis causing acute intestinal obstruction and sometimes perforation. How to minimize this? Uh, huh, yeah, I got it. Yeah. Uh, my presentation here is to give uh, practicing surgeons as well as those working in institution as residents, full-time surgeons, a practical approach when they encounter such cases with complications. Now, coming to the types of infections involving small bowel. Now, coming to the general infection, which are due to common pathogenic organisms such as coliform bacilli, shigellosis, campylobacter, giardiasis, rotovirus, norovirus, and amoebiasis, whereas specific infections are mycobacterium tuberculosis, salmonella typhi, and worm infestation. I'll be talking mainly on specific infection. I'm uh, starting with intestinal tuberculosis. Now, intestinal tuberculosis forms a major part of abdominal tuberculosis and which accounts for extra pulmonary TB. The overall incidence of extra pulmonary TB is almost up to 50% and it is much prevalent in developing countries like uh, India due to following conditions. One is low socioeconomic strata, malnutrition, Overcrowding, poor education, limited access to healthcare facilities, rising incidence of HIV, use of immunosuppressant drugs, and emergence of MDR strains of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now, coming to this historical review of literature, tuberculosis was first recognized in 4th century BC. Hippocrates described a condition resembling tuberculosis in a patient with pulmonary lesions and intestine. An early reference was made in 1643 when autopsy on Louis XIII showed ulcerative intestinal lesions associated with a large pulmonary cavity. John Hunter described the microscopic tubercles in liver, the spleen, the uterus, the course of intestine, and the peritoneum. In 1882, this was the landmark uh, discovery of uh, causative organisms, mycobacterium tuberculosis by Robert Koch. It 
A major cause of intestinal stricture and bowel obstruction in 19th century and the early part of 20th century. Now, coming to this issue, pathogenesis, intestinal tuberculosis has been attributed to hematogenous spread from primary focus acquired during childhood with later activation of latent infection. This is swallowing of infected bacilli from active pulmonary tuberculosis, local spread of adjacent viscera from the adjacent viscera. In all these cases are caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. In olden days, there was infection due to mycobacterium bovis, which is now rare due to majors like pasteurized milk. Now, coming to the pathology, the GI tract microfold cells are associated with Peyer's patches. They phagocytose the tubercle bacilli via lymphatics. It is then transported to the mesenteric nodes. The mesenteric nodes get matted and caseate, which causes cellular infiltration, lymph node enlargement, and local edema, which can lead to inflammatory masses. End arthritis and caseating necrosis causes transverse mucosal ulceration, which Dr. Mohan Doshi had spoken about it. Uh, increased fibroblastic activity leads to local bowel thickening and intestinal narrowing, which leads to multiple bowel strictures. Histological picture includes epithelioid cell granuloma with peripheral rim of lymphocytes and plasma cells, Langen's giant cells, and central caseating necrosis, which is the classical picture, and I think everyone is aware of it. IC region is the most commonly affected due to high density of lymphoid tissue, physiological stasis, increased fluid and electrolyte absorption, and minimal digestive activity. Now, uh, coming again to continue with the pathology, Hoon et al. in 1950 categorized the intestinal lesions into ulcerative, ulcerohyperplastic, and hyperplastic. The ulcerative forms are normally seen in malnourished patients and commonly in small in, uh, bowel. Hyperplastic forms are seen in relatively well-nourished patients with a strong host resistance. These types of lesions are seen in IC region and colon. Now, these are the few uh, photographs of these uh, ileal strictures, and I think everyone is aware of it. Yeah. Now, coming to the symptoms, it is commonly seen in young adults between the uh, age of 20 to 40 years. In India, it is more common in females, especially some studies which have, uh, which have after, uh, you know, review of the literature that in some cases, the females have been more common. Now, there are constitutional symptoms like low-grade fever with evening rise, lethargy, malaise, night sweats, anorexia, and weight loss. It is frequently seen in ulcerative tuberculosis of small intestine. There is a general abdominal distension ascites, colicky pain, alternating diarrhea, and constipation. Now, in an examination, is abdominal mass depending on the region involved. Ascites with horseshoe dullness or shifting dullness, sometimes localized ascites, barbarygmy with visible peristalsis over abdomen, especially in case of thin patients, and then uh, having uh, obstructive features, may present in acute abdomen with due to perforation features of intestinal obstruction. Now, coming to the investigations, here the routine blood investigations like CBC, ESR, which will show anemia, relative lymphocytosis with the raised ESR, serum proteins will show hypoalbinemia, especially in malnourished patients, CRP, which may be raised, serum CA125 may be raised, Tuberculin test, which we normally use to perform, is of limited value as there may be previous sensitization with contacts or BCG vaccination. It may be negative in malnourished patient, concomitant HIV infection, chronic renal failure, lymphomas, and fulminant tuberculosis. Now, radiological investigations, they form a very major uh, role. 
Uh, X-ray chest will show an either active focus or a heel lesion. X-ray abdomen in standing position will show multiple air fluid levels in the intestinal obstruction and free gas under diaphragm in case of perforation. Ground glass appearance in case of ascites. Barium meal follow through study may reveal increased intestinal transit time, hyper segmentation of a barium column, precipitation with flocculation of barium, thickened mucosal folds, and hourglass strictures. Multiple strictures with segmental dilatation and fixed and matted intestinal loops. Depending on the bearing find, there have been various signs which have been described, such as Fleshner sign, wolf's neck deformity, st uh, sterling sign, and string sign. Now, this is, a, this is the X-ray of abdomen, which is showing multiple air fluid levels. On the left-hand side, it is, I think, appears to be an ileal obstruction, whereas on the right-hand side, that is B, it shows uh, a jejunal obstruction. These are some features of the barium follow-through findings which showed various appearance of strictures as well as dilated bowel loops, you know, this. Now coming to the ultrasonography and CT scan. This is the management algorithm, which, uh, you know, has been shown here on this slide. That sonography is the first line. And if that is suggestive of uh, features of tuberculosis, then you go for the treatment in suspicious cases, go for contrast studies. If it is normal, then you do a CT scan of abdomen. Now, CT scan, if it shows classical pattern, again, you go with the treatment. If it is doubtful, then you perform a FNSC or a biopsy. Now, microscopy and culture, a demonstration of AB bacilli on microscopy or culture is considered as a gold standard for diagnosis. Now, AB can be detected by smear, of, uh, by Zeal Nelson or Oramin, uh, Rhodamin fluorescent stain. Culture in LJ medium or Bactec 460 liquid medium, but the sensitivity is low. Yield can be increased by immunohistochemical staining. Culture is highly sensitive, but it requires uh, six to eight weeks to obtain the positive result, which is a drawback. Acetic fluid examination. Now the salient features are it's a straw colored fluid with uh, proteins more than three grams, cell count more than 1000 and predominantly lymphocytes. Fluid albumin levels are uh, less than 1.1. Then uh, ADA activity, that is uh, adenosine deaminase activity with a cutoff value between 33 and 32 units per liter. But the sensitivity may be lower in HIV patients and cirrhotic patients. Acetic fluid LDH levels less than 110 units per liter with ADA more than 33 has a sensitivity of 97% and specificity of 100% in tuberculosis. Now coming to the endoscopy. Endoscopy uh, is a double balloon enteroscopy or push enteroscopy is helpful in jejunal lesions. Capsule endoscopy can be a useful a diagnostic modality, but should be used with caution, especially when you are suspecting an intestinal obstructive features. Colonoscopy is useful for colonic and ileocecal disease, and this should be combined with histology and culture. Now, these are the different endoscopic images which are seen, which are showing ulcerative forms of ileocecal tuberculosis. Then it is showing hyperplastic forms of ileocecal tuberculosis. Uh, then uh, contracted cecum and various uh, uh, such uh, features which can be noted. And the last uh, slide is showing a uh, contracted cecum with um, a multiple ulceration on the IC wall. Now laparoscopy is again a uh, important modality for early detection, especially with TB proteinitis, mesenteric node biopsy and serosal involvement of small bowel. Or it should be used in caution in case of fibroadhesive lesions and should be avoided in case of intestinal obstruction. Now, serological test, enzyme like uh, immunosorbent assay, ELISA has variable sensitivity and specificity, and most of these tests remain positive 
after anti tubercular therapy hence these tests are not for preferred as a diagnostic test in intestinal tuberculosis now this is amplification method which are the newer techniques which show and they detect directly the mycobacterium tuberculosis dna in a clinical samples using mycobacterium tuberculosis complex specific primers a pcr is a not invasive test and it can provide a rapid diagnosis with high specificity up to 100% it can differentiate intestinal tuberculosis from crohn species but the limitation is the high cost and it cannot assess the bacterial sensitivity to anti tuberculous drug now the management wise initially always these patients are started on a medical line of treatment and the commonly used first line of drugs are rifampicin isoniazid pyrazinamide etametol in extra pulmonary tuberculosis akt is continued up to 9 months as per the who protocol and for first 3 months all four drugs are continued and after completion of 3 months pyrazinamide is omitted and other three drugs are continued for next 6 months doses are calculated as per the body weight of the patient in mdr second line drugs are used here in group 2 moxifloxacin and high doses of leofloxacin normally up to 750 mg are used whereas in group 3 linezolid delamanid and vidaquinoline are uh, is used in cases of extreme drug resistance vidaquinoline fumarate is approved by us fda now coming back to the surgical treatment which is our going to be the main uh, talk now surgical treatment can be on emergency basis or on elective basis emergency the patient may present with obstruction obstruction with perforation if there is obstruction with perforation again it can be uh, you know divided into minimal contamination and severe contamination whereas elective is ileal strictures especially after giving nkt also if you find that patient has symptoms of obstruction then you know we'll have to go ahead for surgery and of ileocecal ilo region now surgery in the emergency setting the patients presenting with obstruction without perforation we should have to stabilize the patient hemodynamically before taking for surgery under broader antibiotic cover on exploration assess for the cause of obstruction in case of stricture of ileum if there is a single stricture which is possible then stricturoplasty should be performed if there are multiple strictures in a relatively short segment of ileum or jejunum then the segment should be resected and end to end anastomosis should be performed if ileal stricture is very co close to the ic wall or there is a localized involvement of terminal ileum cecum and ascending colon the patient is hemodynamically stable then a conservative resection of terminal ileum cecum and proximal part of ascending colon should be excised uh, uh, which is also known as quarter colectomy with relation here uh, the important point which should be remembered is the right uh, colic artery you know it should be preserved uh, only ileo uh, and with ileo ascending anastomosis now surgery in emergency setting with patient presenting with obstruction perforation but minimal contamination perforations are usually found to be close to the stricture because again there is a uh, because of distension there is a lack of blood supply there is always end arteritis so the proximal supply uh, proximal uh, loop suffers most if there is no significant contamination then perforation after uh, fractioning the edges should be extended across the uh, stricture and a stricturoplasty should be done thorough peritoneal lavage should be given tube drain should be placed in the peritoneal cavity if multiple strictures in a short segment of small bowel with a perforation then that segment with perforation should be resected and end to end anastomosis should be performed a tube drain should be kept in the peritoneal cavity now coming to the surgery in the emergency setting a patient presenting with the obstruction with perforation and severe contamination here the first part is always 
proper resuscitation of the patient and make the patient hemodynamically stable before the laparotomy is performed. During the laparotomy, if there's a single stricture with perforation, which is close to the stricture, then the stricture together with the perforation is excised and end to anastomosis should be carried out. Uh, so end should be brought out as ileostomy, uh, which can be closed at a later date. If multiple strictures with perforation of the entire segment, uh, multiple perforations, then the entire segment to be bypassed and ileo transfers anastomosis should be done. If you're not sure about the anastomosis, then the proximal loop ileostomy should be done. Multiple drains should be inserted in the peritoneal cavity for peritoneal lavage if necessary. In case I see in case of in ileocecal tuberculosis with perforation, ileo transfer anastomosis with proximal loop uh, ileostomy should be performed. Surgery in the elective set, uh, setting with for ileal stricture, again, as I mentioned, if it's a single stricture, which is passable, then stricturoplasty, which uh, has, uh, I don't know whether it is because when I was uh, in KM that time, we used to have, we used to do this stricturoplasty very often. Uh, for impossible stricture, obviously it is resection anastomosis. Multiple strictures in a raw, so relatively short segment, a resection anastomosis of the entire segment. Now in the elective setting for IC region is again a quarter colectomy, which is conservative resection of the terminal ileum, cecum, proximal part of the ascending colon should be excited with ileo ascending anastomosis. Now let us come to the second most important infective pathology that is enteric fever. Now enteric perforation uh, is a serious complication of typhoid uh, fever and the condition has a high morbidity and mortality in many developing countries, including India. No consensus exists concerning the best procedure to be performed for in these cases. Now, historical review, I think uh, it is, uh, historians believe that typhoid was mainly responsible for a widespread plague in Athens. It was way back in 430 before Christ. Jamestown, which was the English colony in Virginia, it also was thought to be by some historians that uh, uh, that the town, entire town, had uh, this typhoid fever, and uh, that fever proved fatal. Typhoid has been responsible for eliminating excess of eighty thousand soldiers, uh, soldiers which died of uh, uh, fever or dysentery in American Civil War. Now, Mary Mellon who is commonly known as Mary, Typhoid Mary, which I think all of us are aware in, from the school days that she was a widely known carrier of the typhoid fever. She worked as a cook and throughout her career is thought to have infected 51 people of which three cases were fatal. Now coming to the etiopathology and uh, etiopathogenesis and pathology, typhoid fever is a severe febrile illness caused primarily by gram negative bacilli Salmonella, Enteridis, Saroor, Typhi. Transmission occurs via fecal oral route due to contaminated food or water. They have specialized fimbria that adhere to the epithelium on clusters of lymphoid tissue in the ileum, which contains pear patches. And the main point of re entry of macrophages that travel from intestine to the lymphatic system. Typhoid, Salmonella, co opts the cellular ma machinery of the macrophages for its own reproduction as they are carried throughout the mesenteric lymph node to the thoracic duct and the lymphatics uh, then uh, to reticuloendothelial system of the liver, spleen, bone marrow and lymph node. Bacteria then infect the gallbladder through bacteremia and uh, or direct spread of the infected bite. The result is the raw organisms re-enter GI tract through bile and again reinfect the pears patches. Bacteria that do not reinfect in the host are usually throw themselves in stool and they are again uh, available to infect the other. And does the cycle continue? Now coming to these symptoms, uh, all of you are aware. So I'll go into uh, in a hurry, high fever, headache. Now abdominal symptoms like colicky pain, constipation or diarrhea, muscle cramps, sweating, loss of weight and appetite, skin rash, die cough. 
Now examination finding, now this is, I am limiting myself to only suspected perforation. This is tenderness and guarding over the abdomen, rebound tenderness, distension of abdomen, the cold clammy extremities, which are indicative of uh, toxic shock, septic shock, tachycardia, and signs of uh, septic shock. Now investigation, there's a simple mnemonics, I think, which all of you will find interesting that you remember it by the word basu. Blood culture in first week, bone marrow culture is better, but not commonly done. Antibody detection, that is Vidal, it is second week. Stool culture is in third week and urine culture in fourth week. Now, this is the next ray, which is showing classical gas under diaphragm which is a classical sign for any uh, perforation, which uh, most of the time we can always notice this. Now, this is the ileal perforation, which is being shown here. Now, coming to the medical management, you have to stabilize the patient by maintaining hydration, blood pressure with crystalloids and antipyretics, judicious use of ceftriaxone, cefexime, leofluxacin, amoxicillin, supporting treatment, like uh, PPI and LJ6. Now coming to the surgical management, now here, depending on the general condition of the patient and degree of contamination and expertise of the operating surgeon, these are the various modalities which are uh, available. This is just plain simple debridement with uh, double layer closure, segmental resection anastomosis, loop ileostomy, resection with end ileostomy with a distal mucous fistula. Now, this all depends on how much is the contamination, how is the patient general condition, what is the expertise of the operating surgeon. So, various factors, they come into picture before, you know, you can undertake this decision. Safest, whenever you find that there is uh, going to be a lot of, uh, you know, contamination, safe one is to bring the loop out. So later on, any problem, you know, which can be tackled at a later date. Now, the next infection, which is very common, again, in our tropical uh, country like India, is Ascariasis. Now, Ascariasis is the largest nematode, a roundworm, which is parasitizing the human intestine. The Ascaris lumbricardus is the intestinal worm found in the small intestine of man. They are more common in children than in adults. And as many as 500 to 5,000 adult worms are uh, may inhabit a single host. Now, this is the historical review. And uh, this has been, you know, it has been a very ancient disease since Roman times, Egyptian mummies, uh, the Chinese uh, Ming dynasty. And uh, because of all this, the important details of his life cycle, epidemiological factors were known in early part of the century. Even at the turn of the century, with advanced medicine, it continues to cause symptoms, illness, and death. Geographical distribution, it is a common uh, human elementic infection, worldwide distribution, highest prevalence in tropical and subtropical region, and areas with inadequate sanitation. Morphology, it is an elongated cylindrical uh, tapering at both ends. The sexes are separate. The female is longer than male, 20 to 20, 35 centimeter long, 4 to 6 millimeter in diameter. Male is smaller, in 15 to 30 centimeter long, and 2 to 4 millimeter in diameter. The posterior ends of the male are curved and having pin, uh, pineal uh, setae at its near end. Now, this is the life cycle, how the spread occurs. Now, interesting that, you know, the, the worms, hatch worms, they migrate into lungs and from lungs again, you know, uh, they are swallowed back and then again they re reinfect the GI tract. Now this adult worm normally leaves in the lumen of the small intestine. Uh, female may produce approximately 2 lakhs eggs per day which are passed down in feces. Unfertilized egg may be ingested but are not infective. Fertile uh, eggs embryonate and become infective after 18 days of several uh, 18 days to several weeks. After infective egg, eggs are swallowed, the larvae hatch, invade the intestinal mucosa, carried via the portal vein, and then the systemic circulation to the lungs. Larvae mature further in the lungs, 
in 10 to 14 days, penetrate the alveolar wall, ascend the bronchial tree to the throat, and they are swallowed. Upon reaching the small intestine, they develop into adult form. Between two to three months are, uh, are required from ingestion of infective X to OV position by adult female. Adult worms can live up to one to two years. Now, symptoms, you know, either they can be totally asymptomatic, but in stage one, the worms, uh, worm larvae in the bowels attached to the bowel wall. Stage two, the worm larvae migrates into lung. That time, patient may experience fever, breathing difficulties, cough, coughing, and pneumonia. Now, the stage three, the worms enter the small intestine and mature into worms and remain there to feed. Abdominal symptoms of abdominal discomfort, intestinal blockage, which can be either partial obstruction or a tot complete obstruction, total intestinal blockage, severe abdominal pain, vomiting, restlessness, disturbed sleep, worms in stool, worms in vomit. I think all of us must have seen all these cases. Now, examination finding now here again pertaining to the surgical, uh, uh, you know, problem. The abdominal, there will be abdominal distension, uh, lump in the abdomen due to mass of form, and there will be visible peristalsis. Now, investigations include stool microscopy, chest x-ray, abdominal x-ray, sputum and gastric aspirate, uh, ABC, contrast study, barium follow-through. Interesting feature of this is it may show the GI tract of the worms uh, in the barium follow study. I was not able, I could not get it, but you know, in KM we have seen that uh, uh, the barium solo or follow through shows uh, a GI tract of the worm also. And serum uh, antibodies to the Ascaris salimbricardis, serum IgE, interleukins, and urine based gas liquid chromatography. Coming to the medical management, infections with Ascaris are easily treated with a number of anti helminthic drugs. Pyrental palmoid is given as a single dose of 10 milligram per uh, body weight. Levomisole is given as a single dose, uh, 2.5 milligram to, uh, per kilogram. Mebendazole is given as a single dose of 500 milligram. Albendazole is given as a single dose of 400 milligram. Surgical management. Now, it is done as an emergency procedure in case of intestinal obstruction due to mass of forms. Now, normally enterotomy is done to extract the mass of worm, followed by suturing of the enterotomy in two layers. A rarely resection anastomosis for impacted mass, debridement of the perforation, followed by suturing. Here I am limiting myself only to the intestine because that is the topic which has been given, but they can migrate to any place, especially more so in a, uh, a sphincter of OD, and they can migrate into the uh, common bile duct causing obstructive jaundice and uh, so many other uh, complications which can take place. Now, coming to the conclusions and a take, take away message, take home message is, you know, the specific infection involving small bowels is a challenging problem. Surgical intervention is required in case of complications due to the specific infections. Timely intervention is not only life-saving for the patient, but a very gratifying experience for the operating surgeon. Because of the non-specific clinical features, ignorance and malpractice, intestinal uh, tuberculosis, which presents late, IC cox is becoming less common as compared to the small bowel structures. Less radical uh, surgery gives a better result. And post-operative complication and mortality is related to the perforations of the intestine at the time of surgery. Typhoid fever is a leading cause of enteric perforation and is still common in India and is associated with high morbidity and mortality. A delayed presentation, preoperative shock, multiple perforations and postoperative complications is responsible for increased morbidity as well as mortality. Early and appropriate surgical intervention, effective preoperative and postoperative care along with the use of appropriate antibiotics is thus deemed necessary for the successful management of typhoid intestinal perforation. Now, this is the point which I would like to emphasize that surgeons who are operating in a small nursing home should judicially opt for a surgical treatment depending on their level of expertise, ICU backup, and training of their staff. It is better to shift to the bigger institution 
with all backup facility rather than regret later thank you very much Thank you, sir, for an, such an excellent presentation. Yeah, you have really taken us back from the life cycle of Asteris to history, and it was very, very. Uh, yeah, this is the PSM. We Normally, quite, uh, involved we actually. <laughs> microbiology yeah. and PSM, you know. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. and, yeah. and also the history great, great. of Fox. You have taken to complete this thing, and of course, you you stress again, again, starting from the basic of. Uh, basics uh, examination to diagnosis and everything you have uh, really covered nicely yeah. yeah any questions so someone has asked uh, in the group uh, yeah. is the role of barium uh, in today's era of ct scan uh, in which case uh, cox, cox, cox abdomen cox abdomen or i think barium still gives a better information you know CT scan naturally, of course, CT scan will be uh, still uh, accurate and uh, investigation and it will, uh, you know, delineate it better. But I think in the primary setting, rather than going straight away for CT scan, I think barium, which is a uh, cheaper. Now, I have, see, I have, my emphasis on this uh, lecture was from nursing home point of view. Yes. Sir. Rather Very than, good. you know, True. spending on CT scan, if a barium yes. is giving you a better information, I would prefer that. You know, of course, CT scan that option is there for you. Yeah. True, sir. True, true. Yeah. Any, 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 any other question? Uh, somebody has said that uh, if you use CatGut sutures for anastomosis, you will get uh, uh, scary those uh, worms to come and eat those sutures. <laughs> I think uh, nobody uses CADGET <laughs> for anastomosis, you know. <laughs> so yes, yes, I, yes. I think it should not be recommended also. Huh? Mm. <laughs> yeah. So you uh, so when we suture, um, normally I prefer years... uh, 30 no. Mersil. Yes, but sir. sometimes, you know, some people I have seen they are using Vicryl also, which yes, is sir. a better, you know. Huh? Ha, 30 Vicryl round bodied. Yeah. And um, one layer suture or two layer suture? I I personally feel two layer suture is always a better. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, for uh -huh. anastomotic safety point of view. Yes, sir. And uh, one more thing. Uh, previously, as you you have given a really detailed and wonderful lecture about. I mean, it was a total uh, lecture from the PG point of view. They will be asked these questions only. <laughs> Means you know. A, any DNB student, any PG student appearing for exams, as well as for uh, um, uh, teaching uh, undergraduates also. Wonderful lecture, sir, Dr. Himan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, if, are there any other questions? Uh, one, uh, Dr. Rajpal, one more question was there. Yeah, uh, someone in us had already answered, but uh, can you ah. just please again highlight uh, the association of uh, LDH and ADA in ascites yes. fluid for Cox? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, that sir. is what, ah. see, that, what I have mentioned is if LDH <laughs> level more than 110 and ADA ah. more than 33, is mm -hmm. supposed to have a better diagnostic, uh, you know, yield. That means the specificity and sensitivity is almost 100%. Mm -hmm. That is what has been claimed over there. And one more thing, sir, that everybody is now getting uh, BCG vaccines. Everybody, almost 99.9. Yes. Yes. So, B, uh, MT is either, how do we say, is it positive, if it is positive or if it is negative? See, how see, do you interpret that? See, when the patient is already yes, exposed you know, with BCG, you know, I think active disease has got no, you know, we cannot claim that, you know, that ah. uh, this active, there is active disease. We hmm. have to go by other criteria. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Abhay, so, I think Dr. Abhay, yes, want, uh, well, we want to... Yes, sir. Yes sir. yes, 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 sir. Yes, yes, sir. Please. Yes, Abhay. Good evening, everybody. It's, it, it, Good it's evening, sir. Excellent Good presentation. Uh, way back Lovely. in, I think, 84 to 86, when I was his co-registrar. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a little bit uh, apprehensive about the performance of my own friend who has been in private practice in a nursing home for a very long time. Yeah. I think I learned a lot. Uh, <laughs> he, has, he has blended so well from so the well. old days into the new uh, things that Kira. are being done. 
Chuk, <laughs> but he will still guide. That is the best thing. No, I I think it, it was a solid presentation and Thank targeted you. towards you. nursing homes. And my last thing is, yes, uh, sir. Whoever is listening, uh, whether mm-hmm. contamination or no contamination, enteric yes, fever sir. is something extremely dangerous. You yeah. cannot predict what is going to happen. Better to do a loop ileostomy and come out. Yes. Uh, very well, very of my yes, yes, tuberculosis yes. with contamination and bad nutrition again diversion is the thing which is being practiced right now at KM Hospital till yes. I retire. Yes, in- yes, yeah, yeah. So it is still it is still uh, the take-home message is if you feel that even if your technical skills are good, it may leak, and then you leak. have to tell the relatives that I have to do second operation to divert no, sir. or no. shift you. Don't yes. get into it. Do a uh, do a diversion and come out. You got to have a very clean case for a resection anastomosis, both in yes. uh, tuberculosis yes. as well as ileal perforations. Yes. I yes. would yes. say in ileal perforations, if the intestines look inflamed, go ahead with a ileostomy. Don't even try to put sutures. Yes. In tuberculosis, if the rest of the intestine looks normal, you can attempt definitely. A resection anastomosis because and a proper resection anastomosis, yes, sir. Yes. taking good, uh, you know, cuff of places and looking at vascularity by re- releasing clamps. How many centimeters would you go, sir? How many that, centimeters? That, that's what. See, what, yeah. what I would do in tubercular strictures is uh, look at the dilated bowel and look at the mm. close, uh, 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 the collapsed mm. bowel. Yes. And then what I will take a triangle of the mesentery about mm. three centimeters and two centimeters on either side. So it's total yes. five centimeters. Release mm. and look at what is happening to the bleeding. If yes. the bleeding is good, good. then you are safe. Because yes, most of the time, these stricture perforations are lymphatic obstructions and lymphatic drainage is as important as venous drainage for this. So if the artery supply is good, I think you should, uh, you can safely go ahead with resection anastomosis if the uh, dilatation against collapsed bowel uh, mouth is not too much. Mm-hmm. One option in this case is, is nowadays people do side to side anastomosis and get away. But for a second exploration, it becomes very difficult because mm-hmm. operation notes are void of what has been done. Yes, and then sir. you start searching for things. Yes, yes. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, we, we One more we point I want to tell P- PGs. In an infective condition do, yes, or sir. obstructive condition with an yes, edematous sir. bowel, please do not use staplers. Yes, it's sir. No, very no, no. clearly written on yes, the staplers sir. itself that please do not use them on edematous bowel. Because yes, the moment the edema goes down, the staples are inactive things they become loose and chance of leak are higher however and if you use good suture material like vicryl hmm. they will it it keeps on holding the entire anastomosis for your sake so yes, that's why vicryl nowadays is preferred over silk i still use yes, silk sir. like yes. hemond does i think we we are yes, old timers so both of you both of you are still Eman, we should say we are young with uh, old thoughts. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We are, we are young in thought. Yeah, we're right. Yes, Absolutely sir. right. Sir, only one thing. Yes. Um, first uh, suture, um, when we take the anastomotic, uh, so when we start the anastomosis, do we include the full um, length or do we only take seromuscular? Yes. Whether it is vital or always full, full. We have to include uh, all the layers. When mm-hmm. you do anastomosis, all the layer. Second layer is cornel. Sir, uh, yeah, no. First, we take a cornel stitch on the other side. And when, um, um, pardon my ignorance, but uh, cornel on either side and then start the suturing. Le- 
but uh, first lens see mucosa to mucosa comes up if 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 we take a zero muscular zero muscular only no mucosa involved how would the anastomosis be first layer is only zero muscular and the second layer would be only zero no, no. i think zero what zero. i practice what i do normally uh -huh. Is yes, I sir. take through and through layer, through and through. First layer, include all the four coats, and the first second layer. layer is to just bury the uh, uh, first layer. First layer, yeah. Okay, sir. That yes. is what I have been practicing. Yes. Let, yes. Let, let, let me let me coming with literature. Yes. There sir. are multiple papers published whether you should include mucosa in the first layer or no. Yes, sir. People like and, us who learnt hmm. taking through and through sutures. For yes, the first layer and zero yes, muscular sir. for the second layer will continue to do it. Hmm. The newer generation, because of papers which are published, do not include mucosa, but yes, have zero muscular type of layers. The danger first is layer. this first is layer. bleeding. Huh. Yeah, the danger uh -huh. is this in bleeding. So uh, uh -huh. it, it, it is absolutely what one learns from your teacher. Yes, sir. And you are successful. Sir. And you are successful in doing anastomosis. So yes, uh, today, let me tell you, uh, my yes, resident sir. possibly did not know how to do anastomosis because of staplers. Yeah, I, yes, I can, I can, uh, <laughs> I yes, can sir. see uh, Dr. Rajiv Sahai uh, yes, joined in from Delhi. Mm. He is a professor of surgery, a very eminent teacher, yes, and he is chatting on this box. So, yes, sir. He's, he really put in some valid comments. Yeah. Yes. So he, he talks mm. uh, absolutely to the point. That yes, is why I, th I thought I should come into because I was in yes, academics. Himan was not. So you Himan will are. talk about what is going on. But academics, yes, there are a lot of ways of anastomosing. Yes, sir. And uh, whether continuous, interrupted, uh, which material to use, there is a lot mm. of things. But that is not, I think, the topic of today. Topic of today was yes, very sir. clear, intestinal very infection. Clear. Yes, sir. From yes, surgeon's sir. Yes, perspective. Yes, yes. yes. I, yes, sir. Uh, I should have corollary. Possibly corollary. talked ah. about because it was intestinal. Yes, sir. I have seen a few cases of amoebic colitis with perforation yes, yes, and sir. requiring colectomy, etc., etc. Maybe ah. Niranjan will cover it, the amoeba, yes, as sir. the pathologist agent. Sometime in future. Yes, sir. Because it can be a fantastic 45 minutes lecture on amoeba. <laughs> yes, yes. Surely, yes, sir. We'll keep it in mind. And yes, I'll, I'll, take, I, I'll, I'll just take this opportunity to say thank you to Dr. Rajiv Sahai for joining a Mumbai yes, Surgery Society from Delhi. Thank from you, Dr. Delhi. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rajiv Sahai. And yes, Dr. Rajiv. I thank thank you so all much. care persons, you know, for uh, and uh, participants for a patient hearing. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. And well, we, pardon we have me if I missed something. Now, <laughs> only point I just wanted to just share with you. I was trying to find the literature. So uh -huh. Apart from these infection, main main infections which you have covered, are there any other infections which are of surgical importance? Doctor Abhidalvi, sir. Can anybody uh, see now that it is open to all participants? Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. Dalvi, uh -huh. sir. No, I, I just told you that maybe ame amoeba could have been then in 45 minutes to cover tuberculosis, enteric fever and uh, roundworms, uh, mm. it would have been impossible. He would have had to truncate it to so much and this basically so being a PG activity, yes, sir. PGs are also listening and yes, sir. general surgeon in general. I also and saw nursing home, a, nursing something home in the chat well box. Mm. One of the nursing yes, home sir. owners has thanked Heman for uh, elaborate this. So, I'm really, watching really this. wonderful, really wonderful. Yeah, so, uh, I think he's detailed. done a good job. Yes, and as I said, job, let Amoeba, hmm. yeah. the, the real Next enemy topic. of Next, Mumbai Next and topic. all over India, be covered hmm. in details by somebody who knows, who or maybe who is an Amoeba. Sir, you can suggest a name, we can approach him. That's <laughs> not a problem. I cannot name an amoeba in Mumbai. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask you secretly, sir. Yeah. <laughs> no, sir but seriously, seriously, we, we need, need to see. Uh, um, Rajesh and me have been operating together sometime, maybe in the past. Seromuscular, um, through and through stitches, 
सीरोमस्कुलर सीकिस वाइक्रियल और सिल्क हाउ हैव बीन द लीकेज See, leakage be, depends. Let's see. Let hmm. depends on number one, general condition of the patient. Number two, yes. local condition of the intestine. Huh. I will never point finger at a surgeon. No, 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 no. Okay. It's only because surgeon I always does his yes, best sir. to best. Uh, yes, to sir. do the best because he doesn't yes. want a leak. Yes, sir. So no, nobody. The problem hmm. with the society is the surgeon is blamed for the leak. Yes, sir. When the yes, patient sir. and the relatives don't know what the pa no. patient is. Exactly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You, boys, you know. If if at all <laughs> yes, you are doubtful, huh. you can do yes, an sir. anastomosis and huh. do a proximal ileostomy. Huh. You need not uh, open it. This yes, is what sir. I had learned in '82. Mm -hmm. Ileal perforations in first house post. I remember we used to close. Single layer, mm -hmm. and bring out a loop and keep it there. Moment patient passes flatus and you are sure that it has healed. We used to just take an incision on the fifth day and put it back. Huh, and yeah. moment we suspected a leak, we used to open it and uh, you know function yes, it sir. as anastomy. So yes, sir. Yes, what I had learned long time back. We hmm. practiced it till my retirement. Yes, sir. I, I always told my lecturer to do that, but this is not published, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in the private setup also, that doing that is a bit uh, what you call problematic, if I may say. See, so the, the patient private have, setup. The problem accepted. is if you tell the relative that I'm going to create a stoma, mm -hmm. there is a storm. It starts yes, there, sir. yeah, yes, and sir. then the surgeon starts wavering. That should yes, not sir. happen. That mm -hmm. I think you, communication is very important. Why stoma is important for a particular yes, patient yes, in a particular yes, family? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's and uh, Dr. Kulkarni has really uh, pointed out all the reasons why stoma should be there, should not be there, also in his detailed lecture. Sir, can I ask one question? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes. So when you, whenever you suture an inflamed bowel for a perforation or something, why can't we bring that particular segment out and exteriorize? Rather than having to do a proximal ileostomy for that, means it would work if it leaks, it would work as an ileostomy only. That was a paper presented uh, by the person practicing at Wapi. Yes, sir. Uh, no name taken. In, in 87. No, I will tell you because I was a houseman. Hmm. And uh, Mama, who was the. His wife's name is Purnima Heranjal, gynecologist. Kishor, Kishor, uh, Kishor. Narkarni. Uh, Kishor Narkarni. Kishor Narkarni, yeah. This, this yes, trial yes. went on in KM under Dr. Bhale Rao and I was the house surgeon there. And we, we used to do that single layer interrupted suture for entry perforation, bring it out and wait for patient to pass flatus mm -hmm. and then put it inside. Uh, if at all there is uh, no leak, if there is a leak, you already have a stoma. So, uh, and this was presented later by Kishore in London. Mm -hmm. So, so Kishore, the, 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 sorry, Kishore, Kishore uh, Narkarni. Narkarni. Kishore, Narkarni. 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 Very oh. senior, five years senior yes. to me. Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. this is an option for you, not an issue. I practiced it in my unit, especially for sigma volvulus. I used to tell them, yes, do yes, anastasia, bring it out and keep, let us see how it goes. Because there is again a lot of publications from South India. For a primary anastomosis of uh, sig uh, for sigma volvulus of colocolic anastomosis. So uh, we had done a study. Of course, uh, publications are wanted. So I was more into then laparoscopy. So I got away from publications. But <laughs> I think a very nice session, Niranjan. You are absolutely right. You can take lead and start this study of primary anastomosis and exteriorization. This was known as exteriorization of anastomotic bowel or perforated yes, bowel. Yes, sir. Yes. So we conclude for the day. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Your group from the chairperson. Thank you. If, 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 you had, if you had kept this earlier, I would have been on my way to Heman's house. <laughs> 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 a wonderful. You are always wonderful welcome. Wonderful. Ah, wonderful. Ah, you are anytime. You are always welcome. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good, good, good night, everybody. Thank you, Zuventel, for their.
continuous enduring support to us. And thank you, Dr. Eman Kulkarni and uh, Dr. Dilip, Dr. Ganesh, for sparing the time and being with us. And, yes, and uh, the, the basic thing is that we all support each other. Yeah. As we are in with each other, whatever steps we take or whatever we do, whether it is we take um, do a primary anastomosis, we do a, a resection anastomosis, or we do a ilostomy, we are there with each other. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Huh. And you. wherever wherever we whatever happens, we do the best for the patient, and we do the best what we are capable of. At yeah. that point of time, whether in the nursing home or in institute or in a super specialty hospital. Yep, surely. Mm. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you, thank you, thank you all. See you, bye bye. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Rajpal. Thank you, Dr. Yadav, and thank you thank so you. much, uh, Dr. Indranjan Nagarwal. And uh, Dr. Abhay Dalvi has really, uh, what you call, taken the cake. <laughs> yes, yes. Is he still there? Oh, yeah, I am very much there, but I don't see any cake. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, you have been, really, you have been the guiding beacon. And uh, we all really follow a steps of a teacher, as you said. And we are, you know, for each other and we teach We yes, really look forward for you your so support. Much, I think we've got good people. Niranjan and uh, Rajesh, Rajesh. Yes, yes, sir. They are, they are really. Dr. Mohan Joshi is still there. Mohan Joshi is still the there. Dean, 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 dean of Sinai Hospital. Dr. Mohan Joshi, in spite of having being a dean, you know, he agreed and, you know, he spoke yes. so well about it. Yes, so well. And a detailed, detailed, totally detailed for the PGs, for us, for uh, consultants, super consultants. Yeah. Mm. What do you call gastroenterology, DM, or uh, whatever, MCH. MCH gastro also. Yes. Let us talk. Thank Dr. Mohan Yoshi, sir. Yes. On Ayaga. I think he's only. Uh, <laughs> he's not there, most probably. I see. I think. Should we should call, you... it, call it a day now? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Chal. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nice thank you. Good night. Thank, thank you, Dr. Dalvi, and thank, thank you, Dr. Kulkarni, and thank, thank you, you M MSS, for giving us the opportunity, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Rajesh Adam, sir. Thank you, sir.